Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Rebecca Larson. I'm an associate professor and extension specialist in the Nelson Institute for Environmental Studies, um, as Zong mentioned earlier. Um, and today I'm going to talk a little bit about manure emissions during agitation and processing. Um, as we all know, manure storage is a really useful component in terms of our manure management systems. Um, it allows us to uh, manage and have flexibility in the timing of when we apply manure, which we all know is really important in terms of the impact to uh, runoff and uh, precipita avoiding precipitation events and allowing us to even time our manure um, applications to be coincide with when the plants might need it. So it has a lot of important things, particularly for those of us who are in cold weather climates um, where we have frozen ground at some point. So the manure storage allows us a lot of flexibility. So, um, but you know, in terms of manure storage, when we're looking at these systems, regardless of if you have a lot of so solids like the pitcher in front of you, or maybe you have a more um, dilute manure with more liquids in it, um, there's a lot of times in which then you need to agitate manure in order to, um, you know, kind of mix up the nutrients to make it more uniform before application. There's a lot of strategies that people use in this. Um, all of them um, are great and, and, you know, whatever fits your particular manure management system. Um, but one of the things I want to talk about today is what um, some of the gases that might be released during agitation. So we know manure gases, um, as a lot of people um, uh, term them, um, have some potential health impacts. I think um, up until a few years ago, we were most concerned with situations where you were in confined spaces um, in which those manure gases posed the most risk to people when they could not, um, the concentrations were very high and they were kind of stuck in an area because they weren't allowed to dissipate, right? So that allowed gases to really build up. Um, in more recent times, we've had some incidents during, particularly during agitation um, and hauling that had led us to have more concern uh, about the risk to human health in situations such as this. Um, and while this picture I don't think is good at depicting necessarily gases, you can see that even during agitation, it's causing droplets to form. Um, and so those gases are being released, droplets are being released. There's a lot of things that are building up typically um, in the natural process of degradation within the manure storage that are then released, um, the, the larger concentrations are released rather quickly when we're agitating manure. You know, in a traditional time, as I showed in this picture, the gases are always being released from these systems. Um, all of those manure gases are being released slowly. Um, when you agitate, you're really causing those gases that are trapped within the liquid um, to then be released. You know, all those little bubbles that may have come out slowly are now being all released at once. Now that might pose more um, safety risks, right? So the concentrations can be higher around these systems during that time. Um, not always are they higher, but there are certainly times when they can be. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about gas production during storage and agitation. Generally, what's happening there? Well, microorganisms within the manure degrade the organic matter. Um, that happens all of the time. Um, it's a natural process. These are microorganisms that are present in the animal's gut. They pass through into the manure um, and they are released again in that storage process. The gases most often that we kind of group in the manure gases when, when people kind of use that term largely, um, the ones that come to my mind certainly are methane, um, carbon dioxide, ammonia, and hydrogen sulfide. Um, now I would say each of these has their own concerns. Um, some of them are, are a concern because they displace oxygen. Um, some of them are concerned because they have more acute problems. Um, but generally these particular gases are dispersed into the atmosphere um, and, and in, a, in a, maybe a lot of circumstances, you would see that gases are dispersed, the concentrations then as they travel farther away from the source become more dilute. And that dilution reduces your risk as a human or an animal near that area. Um, I wanna mention that methane um, is an explosive gas. And so there's a range of explosive range that they have where methane can then cause um, concerns that way. Carbon dioxide is mostly a concern as it displaces oxygen. So if you had a lot of carbon dioxide where it displaced enough oxygen, you have some human health concerns there. Ammonia and hydrogen sulfide both have toxicity um, concerns, um, but the one gas that I think is the biggest concern 
um, for human health is hydrogen sulfide from manure systems. It, it really has potential to cause a lot of human health concerns and, and increase your risk significantly at somewhat low concentrations. Um, I also wanted to mention, aside from manure agitation, manure processing facilities are becoming more and more common, at least in the areas where I am working in Wisconsin. And, and while they're great and they allow for a lot more management um, of manure and have a lot of wonderful benefits, um, it is really important to mention these particular areas with now these walls and other things that limit dispersion need to be um, have proper aeration in them. So talking to an engineer, talking to someone else who can help you design um, the airflow that needs to happen within these spaces in order to not allow those concentrations from these systems to build up as well. Um, the reason I mentioned that hydrogen sulfide is so concerning as a gas is that, um, you know, it really has the potential to cause um, uh, issues to consciousness, so you can lose consciousness, um, and then you can even um, be killed from this. And we've had some incidents where this has been the, the gas of concern that has led to some um, significant um, impacts. I would say one of the things that I want to mention about it is a lot of people know hydrogen sulfide as being a gas that smells like rotten eggs. Um, and so sometimes at a pretty low concentration at about 0.3 ppm, you can start to smell this offensive odor, you might get a headache. Um, and then it, as it increases in concentrations, it smells worse. Um, you can start to feel it if you're, particularly if you have asthma. Um, but the problem is that sometimes people use this uh, it, scent as a guidance as to whether or not the concentration is strong. And I wanna warn people that that's not a particularly good strategy because you'll see that at 150 ppm, something called olfactory paralysis happens in which you can no longer smell. So if you're trusting your scent as something to tell you that the, co the concentrations are going down, I can no longer smell it. Well, that could be true, but it also could be true that the concentrations are still increasing and you've had paralysis of the components of your system that allow you to smell. Um, as you get up to 500 ppm, you again reach those concentrations which can cause loss of consciousness and then beyond that can cause death. Um, ammonia also has some of these acute um, uh, potential at, at certain um, ppm or concentrations. They can you know, cause irritation, a strong cough. Uh, this is another gas that we commonly talk about in terms of silo gases. Um, it can also be lethal at pretty high concentrations. I would say of the data that I have seen, we don't get anywhere near the lethal concentrations in terms of ammonia from manure systems that I have ever measured. Um, the hydrogen sulfide is really the more concerning gas when we're talking these acute concentrations. Um, again, methane is a concern for explosion, and then CO2 generally, um, when you start to hit those concerns of like it's um, replacing a lot of oxygen. Those are, 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 are typically the situations you're going to see in manure systems. Um, there's a lot of standards out there you can look to. Um, I like to look to these OSHA occupational standards. We've kind of compiled a few here in this table. Again, I'd like to point to the hydrogen sulfide here. It has a ceiling. That means a maximum concentration you should be exposed to, which is 20 ppm. Um, and I want you to remember that kind of in your head. I'm going to show you a little data later um, in, in that same kind of units. Um, and then they say you can have a 50 ppm ceiling so long as it's only for you know, less than 10 minutes and no other measured exposure occurs. Um, but I would say in manure systems, you're getting regular exposures to hydrogen sulfide at, at least at low concentrations. And we want to be careful of the times when we're getting to, uh, up past those ceiling concentrations. Um, now, I also want to mention when we're talking about gases, what is increasing my risk? What is increasing these concentrations um, that might increase my health risk as a human being, right? And so um, one is increased gas production. So that usually happens when we have increased microbial activity from increased temperatures. Um, we, have, we can also have a dis decrease in dispersion. That's the gas allowing it to dissipate and reduce in concentration. That happens when we have no or low wind or when there's structures involved that can kind of block the wind from moving, such as a building or um, walls or trees. Um, and then the distance from the source. So it's a closer I get to a source that's releasing hydrogen sulfide, the more chance that my risk is gonna increase the greater the chances are that there might be higher concentrations in that area. Um, we get increased hydrogen sulfide in particular 
when we have additional sulfur in manure, uh, to particularly from byproducts like distiller's grains um, or gypsum, those both have um, increased sulfur concentrations. Um, and then that excess sulfur can exit the animal. Um, increased manure sulfur content leads to increased H2S production, we know that. Um, and then there's lots of data out there. In Wisconsin, we have some for the median for uh, cattle, um, from you know about a half to three pounds of sulfur per 1,000 gallons of manure. Um, you can find some typical numbers for all types of animals out there. You can reach out to people like me in each state, or you can send me an email if you would like to know more. Um, I'm happy to provide those numbers, but it's just good to, as a kind of check if you think you're um, regularly exceeding hydrogen sulfide levels that are uh, of risk, and I'll talk about how to know that later. Um, but then if that's happening, you know, it's a good thing to check. To, to make sure is my manure have so much excess sulfur that that's leading to some of the concerns. So I just wanted to show, you know, that each of these factors can be looked at individually. So in, in, in this case, in the controlled environment, as the temperature goes up, my hydrogen sulfur, um, hydrogen sulfide concentrations from manure um, increase, right? So you can see in this case, around 65 to 70 degrees Fahrenheit, we start to see some increases significantly from that zero point up into those higher concentrations, right? And as the temperature increases, we get more and more H2S production. Um, again, that gas dispersion, I just want you to visualize a little bit that the gases and their concentrations with wind and dispersion can spread out and get lower, decreasing your risk, right? But if they're blocked, right? I have a structure that's blocking that wind. It can trap some of those gases in situations that make your risk higher. Um, your exposure, right? So one really big thing about risk is the lower that if you can reduce your exposure to these particular things, you can really reduce your risk, right? So if you don't need to be around systems that are producing gas, if you don't need to be around the manure storage, if you don't need to be doing something, don't, right? You don't need to be, if, if you can be away from the uh, location, if you can reduce your, the times you're exposed to manure gases, uh, those are all really great things in reducing your risk. I do want to mention a, a, a case in Wisconsin, um, bring that to your attention that we had that really started us looking into all of this where unfortunately um, a young gentleman lost his life. Um, it was very warm that day. Uh, he was running um, his agitation system waiting for the custom haulers um, in the early morning hours. Um, and someone, when they eventually got there, um, uh, still early in the morning, found him um, unresponsive uh, near the manure pit. Now you'll see in this case, it's an outdoor, Pit. Um, it doesn't have a ton of barriers, but there are some buildings around there. What was able to be done is they were able to check his blood and found that hydrogen sulfide, the style sulfate was much higher than recommended um, uh, uh, levels. In this case, the, the sulfur in the manure was a little bit elevated. Um, and then they had really high temperatures and they had really low winds, right? So there's a lot of circumstances here that led to higher risk. Um, so in our recent work, we were doing some indoor and outdoor assessments to try to understand and give a little bit better understanding of what the, what the risk, what might increase risk chances in these kinds of um, scenarios. Today, I'm only going to talk about the outdoor assessment um, due to time, but I want to show you just a few pieces of data. And I, I know the, these can be a lot to look at, but what I want you to understand here is that that kind of blue line going across is showing us that we're getting above that. 20 degrees Celsius, right? So that's a you know higher than 70 degrees Fahrenheit, right? So the temperature is high. We have a whole, all of those spikes are the hydrogen sulfide. Those are well above the 20 ppm ceiling that we were seeing, right? And this is all outdoor near a, an outdoor storage while it's being agitated. And the, the trend that we're starting to notice is if you see the wind is under five miles per hour, um, in most of those times where the spikes are going really high. So wind is really important. All of these factors that I told you have different, you know, on different days and different, different circumstances can play a role. But one of the really big things we're seeing is these higher temperatures and low wind days, we're seeing a, a lot of spikes in hydrogen sulfides when we're agitating. I will say in the days where we were not agitating, we never saw anything even come close to the ceiling. So when we were just monitoring, you know, similar warm temperature days around manure storage pits. Now, that's not to say it can't happen, but it seems that the risk is much lower. Again, here's another piece of data. Again, we see spikes way over the 20 ppm. 
again, it was warm above 70 degrees Fahrenheit. And again, the wind was below 10 miles per hour, mostly below five miles per hour. Um, we start to see some circumstances where you can see here, the spikes are very low, close to that ceiling. But again, we're getting higher wind speeds in these days. So the wind speed in this one is at the right-hand side. So we're seeing higher than 10 mile an hour winds. And, and even though we're having still some of those warmer temperatures. Again, really low concentrations in this particular day, still really warm and you know, getting up to 25 degrees um, uh, uh, Celsius. Um, but in this case, we're seeing high winds again that, that may have been responsible for keeping that out. So um, I wanna say just a few things. Number one, it's difficult to predict weather accurately. Um, we can't, I, I don't really think it's a good idea for you to say, oh, it's pretty hot and the wind is pretty fast. So that's great. As you'll see with those wind speeds, they're up and down constantly, they're inconsistent. Um, even if you do get weather reports, they're unlikely from your exact location. Um, and it's really difficult to predict how all of these particular things are going to come together. As I keep reviewing the data, I'm hoping to add more and more and put some updates out there in terms of the risk. But what I recommend at this time is using alarms and personal safety monitors. That can really help you understand when the gases are of concern. So there's multi-gas monitors that can be measure many gases. They generally are a little bit more expensive, require calibration, but they, they sell these super easy thing, systems to use. They're just a little more costly. Um, you can have single gas monitors that just measure hydrogen sulfide. I really recommend those. You know, you can buy them between $100 and $200. They last for 24 months. You just clip them on, they'll alarm at 10 ppm. So then you know, remember that 20 ppm ceiling, you know, okay, it's going to alarm at 10 ppm. I know I need to leave this area when I hit that concentration, right? When I hear it alarming and I, I go away. And if you're hearing those alarms repeatedly, you want to start looking at how to reduce those, those risks instead of allowing people to just, you know, oh, hit alarm fatigue because they're going off and off again and again and again. So where the, where the systems, if you feel like they're going off on a regular basis, you really need to start looking at what's going on in your system and try to reduce um, the concentrations and reduce exposure. Um, and then the biggest thing is developing a plan. So you don't want to be in the situation where you're hitting super high concentrations and someone passes out and there's a, a, a you know, bunch of negative circumstances going on and you don't have a plan for how you're going to handle that. A lot of times in these things, the unfortunate thing that happens is someone um, uh, loses consciousness, someone else goes in to help them, and then you end up losing multiple people in some of those events. And, and, and that can be, um, you know, making the terrible even worse. So develop a plan, know how you're going to handle the situations, even letting uh, emergency personnel in your area, giving them some information on how to handle these situations, making sure they understand that as well. Um, there's a lot of fact sheets and online resources that we've put together. This link here, um, if, if you can copy it, or if you go to the learning store um, at, at the WISC.edu, agricultural animal manure, all of this that I've talked about in more detail in this particular fact sheet. A new one will come out soon with some of the updated things from our more recent work, um, but there's a lot of details in that if you want to know more. Um, and I want to thank the USDA for supporting, uh, NEFA for supporting this work and um, I'm going to say thank you.